Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Bill Humphreys. In April of this last year, uh, 2013, Don Gourvet received the Spotlight on the Arts Award for printmaking and drawing. And he's with us here today in the studio to talk a little bit about his work and his experiences and how he grew up uh, becoming an artist. Don, thank you very much for being with us. Well, I'm very pleased to be with you too. Thank, thank you, M. PPTV, right? <laughs> Close. <laughs> BPM TV. <laughs> okay, BPM. <laughs> for inviting me here. And also, I want to thank everyone at Spotlight for their generosity in, in uh, choosing me to, to have this award. Well, yes, more than, more than deserving. And you'll see in a minute why, why it is such. We have some of Don's work that we're going to be sharing with you in a minute. But I wanted to start out just for a second. Um, can you give us a little bit of background, your background, and how you got started or interested in this work, and, or how it evolved within your life? Well, I, as with most younger people, which is the case, I, I love drawing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I drew a great deal. And uh, it wasn't really until I got to um, the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, we were attending the New Built High School. And the most important thing that happened was my teacher, Eleanor Marvin, uh, instilled within me the importance of what I was doing, that it was important to paint and to draw. And up until that time, I, I, I loved doing it and it was enjoyable, but I didn't see how it related to people in general or society. Mm -hmm. So I think the greatest gift that Eleanor was able to give me was Im Im imparting upon me that what I was doing was actually of significance and could be useful. What was the, what was the bottom line of that significance that she gave you? Why, why did she call it significant? Why do you see the work that you do as significant? Well, uh, one of the difficulties with the visual arts is that what you do when you paint and draw, it's, it's somewhat alien to society in general. It, it ought not to be. Mm -hmm. But somehow, um, the way society moves and the economics, etc., cetera, uh, people are preoccupied in large part with, you know, earning a living and, you know, very basic, you know, aspects of life. And painting and drawing and music tend to, people tend to think of them as peripheral things and not very vital, important, major building blocks to a person's education. So um, one of the difficulties, again, with, with the visual artist is their lack of um, feeling as though they are an, a, an active participant in the society, that they are an important part of the society. And it's difficult in large part with an ed educational system that doesn't always impart upon its students the enormity of importance of architecture and literature and painting and drawing and, and the visual arts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's lost. And, and, and one of the reasons that, that people feel as though it's not important is that it's always been treated as well as a minor subject. It's been called that. And the visual arts are not a minor subject. In music, it's a major subject and should be treated as such. And when people show talent and have ability, they should be able to pursue it as they would any other course in a school during the time of the week or the year. Mm -hmm. So it's, that, it's, 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 the, it's so important that, that a person feels of some worth when they have great talent. What do you see as the... To pursue it. What, what do you see as the importance? Why, why is it important? I, I think I know, but I want to... Well, in terms of society yeah. that we live in, yeah. well, it's, it's um, the visual arts and music and, and literature provide hope in large part. They provide great hope for people. They, you can aspire to something greater and you can imagine. I mean, to be visually aware and, and orally aware and be listening and seeing, and it's the great gift of the beauty all around us mm -hmm. that we can look toward and, and even if we don't draw and paint, we like to participate. And people love to come in to, if you have a gallery, they, like, they love to see your work. And, and they want to have some of it because perhaps you're showing them something about their life which they hadn't recognized previously mm -hmm. and want to be able to see more. So they like to have the painting or they like to have the music and listen to it. But, but, but it's a transcendent kind of an experience to be able to, to lose yourself 
into a world of sound or visual and and it's just a, it's so gratifying and inspirational that that it's again hope is a word you know mm -hmm. that i use frequently that 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 there is something which can can elevate your emotion and feeling in which you you think that's true in all art forms? I mean, we, we, you're talking particularly about painting, drawings, and, and sculpture, music. Uh, what about um, uh, what about working with fabric or working with the theater or working? Oh, the theater, of course. I think it's true of all um, all of the arts. But I'm speaking from a very positive point of view mm -hmm. as well, because much of what uh, music and art may do, or what it may inform people of is not only the beauty, but it might inform them of some of the problems of mm -hmm. life and the difficulties. Mm -hmm. And do it in an artful way. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very difficult. Uh, a lot of uh, beautiful, what I see as being very beautiful work, but its literal outcome is, can be uh, ominous. Mm -hmm. and, and, and can be, it can speak of a human condition which may not always be pleasant or uplifting. It can be informative. But it evokes an, an emotion yeah. within people. It should be a learning tool, a discovery yeah. tool, where, where you're discovering and you're finding things out about yourself about your interaction between other people, which I think is a, an important thing in the visual arts, mm -hmm. is the lack of interaction that a lot of artists ever have with other people. They, they go to, they learn a craft perhaps, they go to art school, and when they leave the school, um, they're at the end of the plank, mm -hmm. and they walk off. And many never pursue mm -hmm. their ideas uh, or, or dreams or, or their activities in, in, in theater or music or dance. And again, it's difficult because of the demand in large part. You know, and, and uh, there was a time in, in Europe where if you wanted to be a singer, you could develop your craft. And if you wanted to be a conductor or a musician, you were able to develop your craft perhaps a bit easier because every village, every small city, town had an opera house. And it's, you know, so it was an activity of which was you know, to be expected. Mm -hmm. and, and it gave lots of performers and musicians a chance to practice and learn their craft in the theater. Many of the great conductors really learned music by, do, by, by working in opera houses. So they got a very full idea. I beg your pardon, my, my, <laughs> my phone just went off. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> it, it was I music, it was a soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. It's all right. But, uh, well, we'll move right along. Yeah, you sure. were talking. You were talking about the uh, the arts in Europe. And yeah, and and um, it, it. But you know, the people. Uh, on the other hand, I, I always hear, you know, there are friends of mine, and and people say, I'm going to Europe where they appreciate the visual arts and et cetera, and you know, they have experience and hundreds of years of knowledge and appreciation. But, you know, I will pick up a book uh, by Edouard Manet, who didn't write a great deal, but I happen to have a book of things that he did write. <laughs> and he would, did not think favorably or very highly of the general public and their appreciation <laughs> of the visual arts. So it's, no, it's nothing, uh, you know, unusual yeah. uh, being in Europe or wherever that yeah. uh, the, the artist has to come to some uh, relationship with the public. And being visual and painting or drawing or printmaking, just think of the thousands of hours that the artist puts into what he does to try to get, yeah. to, to realize his idea and develop it. And it can't always be expected that the public is going to be able to suddenly realize what you're doing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and occasionally they do, mm -hmm. because it's obvious, but there's so much really wonderful, beautiful work that is not immediately obvious. And nor should it be to a, to a lot of viewers, because it's it takes you have to cultivate, you have to sometimes work mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the appreciation of so, of something. In music, many of the works, uh, uh, beaut beautiful works that I love the most, are pieces of music which I did not like in the beginning. So I needed to listen a lot. I needed to exercise my, 
you know, listening and thinking and, 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 and I kept trying to understand. And then things start to come into focus. And, and everything is not immediately apparent. or it, You don't immediately become aware. And that doesn't mean it's not good. It means mm-hmm. that you have to put some work in. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes some of the most minimal, terrible works of art are the things that are the, the so easy for people to look at and understand. Mm-hmm. And, and they don't seek much more than the, the superficial pleasure. Getting back to your your start in uh, in the, the arts that you that you participate in, when did you realize that um, that you had an eye or had a skill that could be uh, utilized? I I wasn't really I didn't realize that I had the skill. I mean I I, I knew I did, but again, it, how important was it that I could do it? Mm-hmm. And it really became important when, um, when I went to the high school as, as an eighth grader and Eleanor uh, um, was uh, my teacher and uh, Ed Fogelberg every year, a wonderful, wonderful man, uh, English teacher, would do a senior high school play. And so I was able to participate in doing a lot of the scenery and design. And the most exciting thing at the end of the year was to be able to do these. They were largely musicals. Mm -hmm. Um, And the first one I worked on was, uh, as an eighth grader, was The King and I, Mm -hmm. uh, among many other wonderful things that were being done by the sculptures of students who were doing. And and I got to be, I painted bookcases with books and train, model trains in them. Mm -hmm. And also I painted masts of ships and sails. And so uh, it was a tremendous opportunity if I had an art school and I, I were teaching, one of the things that I would teach painting and I would have everybody work in the theater on the stage mm-hmm. and paint. Mm-hmm. And we painted huge backdrops, mm-hmm. magnificent, big, beautiful ba- And so you worked with your arm and your whole shoulder and you, you made designs for the set. You went through the whole, you know, all of the pouring of large areas of color and and setting the backdrop up and getting way back to see what it looked like Mm -hmm. at a great distance. It was a very big way of working and a free way of working and you were literally immersed in the painting itself. You were standing on the backdrop and you were you were kneeling and you were painting and so and and it was all to the end of of a kind of uh, the finality was that everyone was going to be coming to see what you did (laughs) so it had significance and for many high school students sometimes it was the the most real thing that ever happened to them in a high school because they got on stage they it was demanding they had lines they had to do their role uh, and everything came together for one moment in their in their in that in their life of, of their schooling this, this production took place, lighting and design. It was a world apart from a world. And sometimes that world was more real than yeah. the one they were in. Yeah, interesting, interesting perspectives. Uh, just so that the audience has an opportunity to see what we're talking about here, right? we have some, um, <laughs> some images of your work that we'd like to, uh, like to show them. If we could take a look at that. Maybe you could describe to us, um, this is a very obvious part of Portsmouth. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, uh, the intersection of, of Market Street and Bow Street, which has always fascinated me because the entire architecture of, of the city, of course, is magnificent. And, and also, if you really look at it, that is quite a street, particularly in the wintertime when it's icy. The whole thing, that whole city is sloping down very steeply to a bank and a river. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. And, and, but what fascinated me was the, the joining of the streets and the architecture and the, and the um, perspective. Uh, which I, I do like perspective in, in a very free way. I practice it. But um, I, I sat outside and, and did many of these drawings uh, on site uh, of the city when I first came here. Nice. Yeah. And this one? And this, this is a drawing. I hope they're able to, to save this building. I know they're currently trying to do so. This is the, the abandoned Coast Guard station on... on, on um, Wood Island. Oh yes. And you can kayak out there so easily from Kittery Point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's a beautiful little beach to land the kayak and, and, and the island is just big enough to to support the uh, structure. 
-hmm. And uh, it's just a wonderful old Coast Guard station. And I, I have done a number of studies of, and a couple of small woodcuts of it as well. Uh, but I'd pile all of my drawing supplies into the kayak and kayak on out and just a beautiful, beautiful spot to be in. That's uh, great. That's great. Uh, this is actually a study for a black and white woodcut, which I did. And mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, the other side of, it's on Pierce Island. And if you notice, <laughs> yes. there's our meeting house yes, in the background. Yes, there it is. It's where we are right now. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I drew this meeting house and I did the woodcut of it, but this is the first time I've been in the building, in yeah. the inside of it. And it's a gorgeous building. It's a wonderful clock tower. And I might add a great use presently for the building. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We're enjoying uh, being here. This is the Avdiavka. It's a Russian, well, Russian-named freighter. And uh, I've done a lot of color woodcuts of our visiting uh, freighters. One of the great, great attractions of Portsmouth is that it is a vital working waterfront, something which is fast disappearing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I love the scrap piles and I love the salt piles and the theatricality of these great freighters coming in and out of the mm -hmm. river, mm -hmm. pulled by the tugs. It's, it's really beautiful to look out the window and see this entire ballet going on. You've got several images that you've done of this particular ship. Mm -hmm. Was that opportune? Did it, have, it just happen to be the one that was there that day? Or? It, it happened to be the one that was there that, uh, well, it was probably two weeks it was mm -hmm. in, in port uh, unloading. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very cold and snowy, and, and I guess I just kept coming down it during that period. I have a very long woodcut that I did call First Snow, looking down, um, oh, what's the street? Uh, looking down the street and seeing the entire silhouette of the freighter from the mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's, it's quite striking, but yeah, it was circumstantial. Uh, the combination of snow uh, and, a, and, a, and a salt freighter is hard to resist. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and this, was, this is actually a very long woodcut. It doesn't show it on the television, but it's a very horizontal piece. And, and we have the memorial bridge off to the left. Um, and it's, it's a very long woodcut. Yes, we need the, uh, what do you need? We, we need the letterbox version letterbox of this. Version, yeah. <laughs> we can do that. We'll, we'll put that on. But um, again, it's, this is a view from under the uh, Saralong Bridge where the piles of lumber were and the old railroad ties stacked. And I keep looking for places and views of the city and this was, uh, I did a very big drawing for this. I did a couple of drawings actually. And again, a great view of the city. It's it's uh, beautiful. Uh, Portsmouth is architecturally wonderful. The texture of the city in the background is is very unique, and it really accentuates that fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a, a small woodcut, and I don't do lots of smaller prints, but but this is a very small color woodcut of uh, the two um, two of the tugs down. Mm -hmm. uh, right in front of where my gallery was. I had a gallery on Siri Street, now I have one on Market Street. Oh. And so this was done when I was on Ceres. Yeah, yeah. Iconic Portsmouth. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the Wentworth Hotel, uh, pre-restoration. And what I loved about the hotel was the ghostliness of it and, and its enduring quality throughout any kind of weather or extremities or, or I love the, um, uh, the enduring quality of the structure and also the, the, the architecture, the Victorian quality of it and, and the simplicity of the building is wonderful um, architecturally. And people always say, well, you know, have you ever been up to the Mount uh, Washington Hotel? Have you ever done something like that? And it's not so much that I enjoy doing woodcuts of hotels, mm -hmm. it's just that this particular, mm -hmm. uh, I came up over the hill when most of the hotel was torn down. Yeah. And this yeah. was scheduled to be torn down. I and I came was, up yeah. over the hill and I saw yeah. this mighty, it was like a great ship beached. And I thought, wow, what a magnificent image. When it was about to be torn down, yeah. it, it looked like the, the, um, the Bates Motel. It, it, <laughs> it was very dramatic yeah. and, and the windows and, and uh, there was a fence around it at the time, which I fortunately being, not being a photographer, I was able to, uh, Eliminate the fence. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you a very funny story, and that is while I was sitting and drawing this hotel, a bus stopped, and all of these Japanese people poured out of the bus, 
and they all stood in front of the hotel to have their picture taken. <laughs> because of the, oh, uh, the, the historic, the historic significance of the, historic of the hotel to the Japanese. The yeah. yeah, it put them Amazing. on the world stage oh, as a major player. Isn't that the Russo, Russo Japanese War? Yeah, yeah. So this is really quite an icon for for the people of Japan. <laughs> absolutely. Those are absolutely beautiful. What, can can you give us a quick description? I know this it would take a very long time to do the entire thing, but can you give us a quick description of of the um, the difference between what the two different formats that you're working in? As far well, as well, I do a great deal of drawing mm -hmm. uh, with various medium. Mm -hmm. You know, India ink, uh, you know, pencil, grease pencils, etc., on mm -hmm. paper, and then they're usually uh, my subject for uh, what one calls woodcut. Woodcut is a planographic medium. Wherever you cut into the wood, it doesn't print, and the relief surface does print, and you ink the surface of the wood. And then you put paper on top of the wood, and then I run it through a 300-pound steel roller, which presses the paper down on top of the wood, removes the ink from the block to the paper. So it's a, it's a woodcut template. It's a mm -hmm. relief print. Mm -hmm. And reduction woodcut is a one-block waste method where all of the colors are being printed on a single block over a period of time. The addition has to be done simultaneous to the actual cutting because you'll start out with a number of prints, but you cannot uh, get any more prints than what you actually start out with because what you're doing is destroying the block between each color. What you do is destroy the part of the design where you cut so that it will remain because you're going to layer another color over the top of the previous one. You're cutting windows each time for the previous color to show and be there. So once you've created it, then you're starting to gouge out that What you do is you, you cut the block, like I may have a design uh, which is indelible, that's always there for me to refer to. Yeah. The first thing I may do is, is if I have white paper and I want to use the white as my white paper for my first color, I'll look at that design and cut every part of the design where I want white to be. Because I now see. I'm going to ink the block up my first color. Gotcha. And so it may be, say, a yellow, and I'll ink the block up. Now I'll have a yellow piece of paper with white areas that I had cut. Then what I will do is wash, after I've additioned maybe 20 prints, I'll wash the yellow off the block, look at the design, start cutting every part of that design where I want the yellow to remain. Because if I don't cut it, it'll get color covered over with the next color. So it's a progressive art form. You're destroying the block bit by bit. It's progressive. And, and in many ways, the reduction woodcut is a lot like a music score mm -hmm. in that uh, if you're writing for orchestra, you have the parts written for strings, parts written for brass, parts written for percussion. And so if you isolate each one of those parts, they're interesting in and of themselves to listen to. But when they're all combined, they make a particular sound a gathering of sound, mm -hmm. symphonic. Mm -hmm. So every part has its place in the design, every color, but you don't know what the design is going to be like until the last color. Mm -hmm. So there's a great deal of drama to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you may be working for two months on a block and really not know exactly what's going to happen when you pull the last <laughs> color. Huh? That's fascinating. I mean, that oh. must be very intriguing to you. Well, it's, it can be extraordinarily exciting to ink that block up and then all of a sudden pull the paper back and see all of the colors for the last couple of months previously all acting completely differently and interacting because now this color has been put on and makes them all relate to each other in a, in a way that you could not really, you guessed. It's, 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 a, it, it's a performance art. You're always using experience to, 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 to maybe guess what might happen, but you don't really know until the print is done. And sometimes it's extremely, um, uh, what you would say, um, rewarding. Yeah. And then other yeah. times it's horrific <laughs> because you spent very, all this time you know very much a discovery <laughs> process as you're working uh, through it definitely. all definitely yeah, yeah and yeah. A, a revealing process yeah yeah bit by bit That's and great. it's called and and the and the and the, uh, the medium was really exercised and 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 developed in large part by Pablo Picasso yeah hmm. Do you, uh, are you working specifically with uh, locations around the Portsmouth Seacoast area or are you traveling? 
I don't travel a great deal. One, I mean, I do travel, but not very far from Portsmouth. I, I take care of my teacher, Eleanor. Mm -hmm. She's 98 years old now. Oh She's going to be 99 gosh. in February. Oh my so I'm somewhat restricted in my activities. Yeah. Um, but I always work where I live. Yeah. I, if I'm in a, I live in Ogunquit presently. Mm -hmm. And I, I draw and paint uh, and work where I, I do my surroundings mm -hmm. in large part. Mm -hmm. And I have lots of ideas about things and places that I would like to go to to do my work. But again, and I always work from life. I, I don't like working a great deal from photographs. I like to draw on, mm -hmm. on site. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, because when I'm outside drawing, you know, there's so many dynamics that are inviting themselves to help make what you do. Yeah. Wind, weather, you know, uh, visual things happening and you're adjusting. And with a photograph, it's stagnant. And, and you can do magnificent work from a photograph, and people do. But there's, th they're a point of departure. It's, it's a different experience from working out of doors mm -hmm. in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I like that dynamic mm -hmm. and the changeability. And then when you work inside from that drawing, it can settle in and you can develop it inside free of any of the things that might happen outdoors. Fascinating. But, but from a point of development, the outdoors is great and, and, and nature is wonderful to work from. Fascinating. Endless. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, it's, thank you. Uh, we could, I, I feel very comfortable in the fact that saying that I could sit here for hours and talk with you about, about well, the, the theory of art and the, the importance of it and the process that you're working with and going through. So I thank you very much for well, taking this little bit of time to be with it us. Was likewise, I appreciate very, very much. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. I appreciate it. We'll be back next week with another episode of Spotlight on the Arts. Until then, I'm Bill Humphreys. Please join us again next time.